There are countless options when preparing carefully for a dwarf fortress embark. Between the skills of your dwarves, the items you fill the wagon with, and the animals you bring along, some of you might find it exciting and others overwhelming. The first year of a fortress is pivotal and how you prepare can be the difference between a thriving fortress and a heap of ruins. I'm going to cover around 10 strategies for embarking, all of which I've used at one time or another. This video can be helpful to new players, but might also give more experienced players some ideas if they're in a rut. I'll be using the default amount of 1,504 embark points for all of these strategies. You can increase this number of points to 10,000 in advanced world gen or a tiny bit higher by manually editing world gen files. Some people might consider this cheating, but considering Dwarf Fortress is more of a highly customizable tool for having fun than a game with a win condition, I don't really see how you can cheat at Dwarf Fortress. Do whatever you think looks fun. I'll stick to the default limits, however, so that this video applies to just about everybody. The first strategy I'm going to cover is a generic strategy that is safe for most embarks. It presumes that you have access to trees and vegetation and easy access to stone. This is what I recommend for absolute beginners, or just in general, because it's straightforward and it works. Most of the strategies I'm going to talk about use two miners, which is my general preferred number of miners. Some people prefer to bring one or three, and some niche embark strategies may even involve zero or seven. I personally find that if I have one, I'm not clearing rooms for my fortress as quickly as I need them, and that if I have three, I'm spending more time than I like designating mining jobs to keep the miners busy since they finish them so quickly. Another thing that will be consistent among most strategies I discuss is that one miner will have appraisal and judge of intent skills to act as a broker until I get a migrant more suited to the task. The other miner will have a point in each medical skill so that he can at least take a decent crack at an emergency situation, presuming of course that he isn't the one lying at the bottom of a shaft with his legs broken. I'm not commanding that you give these skills to your miners. Your fortress will probably function alright for the first year or so without them. It's just a generic recommendation to keep the fort running smoothly. After that, I'd go with a dwarf with both woodcutting and plant gathering skills. The idea here is that the dwarf cuts down trees for a while for the carpenter to use as soon as the first tree is felled, and then the dwarf can switch over to gathering plants to develop a surplus of food and to pile up some stuff in advance for the brewing and textile industries. The carpenter is there to make things like bins, beds, wheelbarrows, and cages. Fairly straightforward. I've then got a dwarf with both masonry and architectural skills. He's going to do stuff like build gates in the depot, as well as work up blocks for construction, and tables, chairs, doors, coffers, and statues for furnishing my fortress. A stonecrafter is here to make large pots, as well as build up crafts for trade. I value trade enough at the beginning of the game that this is usually the dwarf I'm most protective over. Last, I've got a mechanic for building mechanisms to be used in setting up early defenses for the fortress. When it comes to items, I'm bringing two picks for my miners, a battle axe for my woodcutter, and an anvil to ensure access to the smithing industry. I've then brought alcohol and food items in a ratio of about 5 to 2, as this is how the dwarves tend to consume these items. This should last me at least until the caravan in autumn. I've then brought some medical supplies such as cloth, thread, gypsum plaster, and buckets in case of that hypothetical emergency that I mentioned. I've brought a few ropes for tying up guard animals, a few goblets so my dwarves aren't drinking booze with their hands, and some bags as it'll be a minute before I get a proper textile industry going, and these are important for cleaning up the sea menace. I've also brought along four cats to oversee the merciless slaughter of vermin that trespass into my food stockpiles. This is a generic but fairly solid strategy that leaves me with 73 points to distribute how I please. A more independent alternative to this generic strategy that focuses around less reliance on trader migrants involves replacing the stonecrafter with a brewer that may also benefit from some butcher and tanner skills. I've also replaced the woodcutter's herbalist skill with grower skills to demonstrate the interchangeability of this strategy. The idea here is instead of focusing on pumping out crafts for trade, you're going to ensure from the very beginning that your fortress can support itself when it comes to procuring food and alcohol. Without a stonecrafter around, you may also want to make sure that your carpenter is producing barrels. For items, they're going to be more or less the same, except I'm bringing much less food and alcohol as I'll be able to produce these almost immediately. I'm also bringing along seeds to allow my farmer to get busy. I'm bringing more plump helmet spawn than anything else as this is a staple crop that can be eaten raw or turned into alcohol and can also be grown year round. The rest of the seeds I'm bringing are centered around alcohol diversity, though they have some other uses. 
This strategy frees up an enormous amount of points that I can then spend on cool things, such as coal or business. Now for the more exciting strategies. What's dwarfier than smithing? This strategy allows you to instantly start up the forge and begin producing metal crafts. It's lacking in a mechanic, so that will likely be the labor that my first migrant ends up with. Outside of the standard positions, I brought along a wood burner to begin processing wood into charcoal to provide fuel for smelting and smithing. This guy's going to be pretty busy for a long time. I've also got a furnace operator for processing ore into ingots. Last but not least, I've got a dwarf with both metal crafting and weapon smithing skills. You could add armor smithing or blacksmithing too if you wanted, but these skills are focused towards setting up the embark and procuring crafts for trade. For embark items, I'm not going to need to bring picks or a battle axe, as I can save a lot of points by simply crafting these items. The anvil, however, is more important than ever before. I'm bringing plenty of food and alcohol as I'm not bringing any dwarves capable of procuring these items. The radically different items are down here toward the bottom. I'm bringing several boulders of magma safe stone. This is incredibly important as without picks I can't mine these stones and I need to build forges and blacksmith's workshops in order to craft picks. Also extremely important is some coke or charcoal to smelt the initial ore I bring to craft the picks. Because I'm bringing bituminous coal, the first thing I'm going to do is process it into more coke. If I didn't have access to raw coal or lignite, I would bring a larger amount of charcoal to make sure I have enough for crafting my tools. I'm bringing a hefty amount of bituminous coal to jumpstart my industry as each rock procures 9 units of fuel, or 8 if you consider the fact that it takes a piece of fuel to process it. I'm also bringing malachite and cassiterite so that I can immediately push out some bronze for tool making. You can do just fine with only bringing copper ore or something else like iron ore, but make absolutely sure that if you aren't bringing tools, that you have some magma safe stone, multiple units of fuel, and an ore that can be turned into a tool making metal. Also a gentle reminder that you cannot craft an anvil without an anvil. Only the gods know how the first anvil came into being. Now to discuss a ceramics based embark. This option is a little bit complicated, but is extremely lucrative due to the value of glazed ceramics. It is absolutely essential for this strategy that you embark somewhere that has at least one clay layer, or else your industry isn't going to be very productive. Even better if you embark somewhere with fire clay or a sedimentary layer with a hefty amount of kaolinite. I also strongly recommend embarking somewhere with a lot of trees because you're going to burn through wood like mad. This strategy saves things like carpentry and mechanics for your first migrants. You're going to want a dwarf with at least a dabbling in masonry and building designer skills, however, so that he can build your initial wood furnaces and kilns. In this case, I've gone with my woodcutter. You're then going to want two wood burners, as you're going to need an enormous amount of fuel and ash. I also recommend two dwarves with potter and glazer skills, even though you won't be able to make full use of them right away. The reason for this is that clay needs to be collected, so you're going to be using a dedicated hauler fairly often for stockpiling clay near your kilns. You could of course use a dwarf with another labor, such as carpentry or mechanics, for this temporarily before getting migrants, but I think having more than one skilled potter is a better use of points in the long run, as it's more difficult to get these skills up for nothing. As for items, a generic set suffices, but remember to bring enough alcohol and food to make it through a few seasons. This is one of my favorite embark strategies due to the versatility of the ceramics industry and the historical flavor of centering a settlement around procuring and trading ceramics. Next is an embark centered around setting up a glass making industry. This one is either more or less complicated than ceramics depending on how you look at it. There are less steps involved in producing finished items out of green glass, but unlike with clay you need to use bags to transfer and store sand. Speaking of sand, it is absolutely essential that you start out somewhere that has the stuff for this industry to function. Other than dice rolling with aquiferous beaches and sand deserts, the best way to do this is to use DF hack, which will show where sand is similar to clay in the vanilla game. Some people consider this cheating, but I don't see what the big deal is. Your dwarves telepathically know about bands of marble and metals deep underneath the surface on the other side of the world from their civilization, so why not surface sand? Given the fact that you only need to produce fuel and not ash, you can get away with a single wood burner at the beginning, though you might prefer two to avoid having your glassmakers outpace your fuel production. Similar to my recommendations for the ceramics industry, I recommend two glassmakers for identical reasons. You won't be able to make full consistent use of them right away as someone needs to haul sand, but the moment you get a few migrants, you'll be happy to have both of them producing glass goods. Unlike the ceramics industry, however, a generic set of items isn't going to suffice. You're going to need bags for this industry to function, and setting up a textile industry takes time and more dwarves. 
Bags are pretty expensive. The cheapest of them cost 10 points each. There is, however, an alternative that some might consider exploitive. Sand itself costs a single point, and each unit of sand you bring comes with a bag for free. The materials the bags are made out of are random, and even giant cave spider silk bags can be acquired in this way. Definitely bring a lot of sand, as you can use it as soon as your wood burner starts pumping out charcoal to make glass products, and you're also going to be needing the bags the sand comes in to continue collecting sand. I'm going to mention something here that some people might consider me a little bit naughty for telling you. The cheap way to get bags at Embark has trade implications. In this test run where I brought 100 units of sand, the bags that came in totaled to a value of more than 4,000 at the depot, which can land me considerably better items than the 100 points it cost me to bring the sand. This might be exploited, similar to throwing extra units of food or alcohol onto your Embark counts to get the cheap extra barrels, so I recommend against this if you're a flavor player, but go all in if you're a power player. And now it's time to cover good old fashioned animal husbandry. You've got a lot of options for animals to Embark with, and I may as well cover this strategy, though I'm presenting it with a little spin of focusing on bone carving. You don't necessarily need to do it this way and can mess around with things like sheep and alpacas for milking and textiles, but when it comes down to it, I'm a man of crafts, and I like to focus on animals that breed quickly and produce carvable products. Outside of the core four of two miners, a woodworker, and a mason, I'm going with a dwarf that has butcher, tanner, and fish cleaning skills. He's going to spend most of his time dealing with the nasty parts of dead stuff. I'm also going to grab a bone carver who is going to be procuring the bulk of value out of this industry by carving bones. I'm going to have a lot of bones. Because I'm focusing on bone carving, I'm also going to gamble a bit with a fisher dwarf and see if I can pull some mussels or pond turtles from my embark. These produce shells when cleaned that my bone carver can process into crafts and other goofy stuff like helmets that are confirmed to not stop the fists of an Eton. If I don't end up with the shells I want, I can just repurpose them for mechanics or something. The items I'm bringing aren't too different from the standard set, though I don't really need to bring as much food since I'll be getting plenty of that from fishing and butchering. What I have here is probably overkill. What is completely different is, of course, the animals. Instead of just a few cats, I'm walking in with cats, pigs, and a whole bunch of peacocks. The pigs here are a decent option as they breed alright, grow up relatively quickly, and produce a decent amount of products when butchered, including hooves that can be carved into crafts. They are pretty expensive in Embark points, however, and for this reason the common choice when focusing on animal breeding at Embark is birds. Birds are cheap, breed rapidly, grow up quick, and produce decent products. I prefer peacocks because they are cool. The ratio between males and females is pretty lopsided for reasons that I hope are self-evident. The meta option seems to be turkeys, which are down here on the next page for me. Though they take longer to mature, they are more prolific egg layers than other birds. I never mess with them because they aren't anywhere near as cool as peacocks. Now you may have noticed that rabbits are super cheap. If you're wondering why they aren't really considered viable for this strategy even though they breed, well, like rabbits, it's because they're so small that they don't produce any processable bones or food products when butchered. All you get out of them is a skull. If you want to be the fortress known for pumping out thousands of rabbit totems, so be it. Now I'm going to touch up on the idea of embarking with an armed caravan. This is one of the most flavorful options as it's a little bit ridiculous to think that settlers would stumble around in the Dwarf Fortress world without some form of defense. It's also a very useful option when you're doing something like embarking in an evil biome or immediately orienting yourself toward the caverns instead of the surface. You're much less likely to have your port nipped in the bud by giant wild animals with a couple of soldiers tagging along as well. The strategy resembles the generic one I talked about at the beginning, but combines the woodcutter and carpenter positions and eschews the mechanic whose usefulness isn't as critical anyway as you've got a couple of big dudes to defend your fort outright. Which skills you give your soldiers are a bit subjective, but here are a few things to keep in mind. Their weapon skills are the most relevant in determining their combat abilities so long as they are equipped with that weapon. Armor user skills take a long time to train without building Rube Goldberg machines that some people consider exploitive. Discipline is often overlooked and is extremely important for a soldier. Without any discipline, a dwarf might start crying and run away from the battle the moment he sees someone get a boo-boo. I strongly recommend giving your soldiers at least adequate discipline, though discipline is also learned through training. For an armed embark, I'm going to of course need to bring some armor and weapons, though keep in mind you could also do something like combine the smithing strategy with this one to procure your own. 
I've gone with the cheapest options for weapons, which I can upgrade fairly quickly as I get access to better materials. For each soldier, I've grabbed a helm, a pair of gauntlets, a pair of high boots, and a set of leather armor for full coverage. I'm going to have my carpenter make them shields for training when the game starts up because metal shields are expensive and heavy. Now I can shave off points here and there to give them better equipment. I'm sure some of you are cringing that I like to embark with goblets, especially since I start out with craft dwarves so often that I could poop some cups out right away. I could drop a couple of cats as well, and if I moved enough stuff around, I might be able to get away with bringing an iron sword and a silver mace. Now here's an alternative option for a defended embark. Instead of relying on armed dwarves, you bring a whole bunch of dogs and train them up for war. This isn't going to be anywhere near as effective as even a single trained soldier is for most situations, but a huge pack of war dogs can effectively fight off wild animals and also give your dwarves time to get inside of a fortress during a major threat so that you can enact your secondary defenses. You can also have war dogs follow dwarves with dangerous jobs, such as woodcutters, herbalists, and fisher dwarves. Better to lose a dog than a dwarf. Now, in this example, I haven't made any changes in dwarf skills from my generic example other than giving my mechanic animal training skills. A dwarf with animal training is all that's necessary for this strategy, so you can combine it with other strategies so long as you're able to afford a whole bunch of dogs to make it effective. As you can see, the items reflect my habits thus far. What's predictably different here is the amount of dogs I'm tugging along. As usual, with anything you intend to breed, you should have significantly more females than males. As you can see, you can bring war dogs outright, but you are able to amass much more dogs by making use of an animal trainer instead, and you're going to need a lot of dogs. Now here's something completely different from the strategies I've shown you thus far. Sometimes you'll find that you don't get the kinds of skills you want for your nobility from your migrants. You could just cope and settle for dwarves that aren't perfect for the job, or you could take matters into your own hands and embark with a pile of engineered nobility. Now some may not even call this a strategy. Nonetheless, I found myself doing this before when frustrated with a lack of good options among migrants for nobles. It admittedly has more to do with flavor than function, as I could give many of these dwarves other skills that could make them useful until migrants arrive, but I enjoy having nobles that are dedicated to their positions, or at least are dedicated to their positions eventually, as with the way I have this set up, they won't be doing much else other than hauling for a while. So I've got a good old-fashioned miner with no other skills, since I already have a dedicated broker and chief medical dwarf. I've also got a stone crafter, so at least something's getting done while these nobles lays about. For the noble dwarves, I've set up one to be a manager with administrative organizer skills, as well as consoler and pacifier skills to quell discontent. I've got a broker with the tried and true appraisal and judge of intent skills, as well as a bookkeeper with his humble skill of knowing the precise amounts of everything in my fortress without ink or paper. I've got a chief medical dwarf ready to go with the scattering of medical skills. I've then got a military commander prepared with leadership, organization, and tactician skills that are relevant in conducting military expeditions outside my fortress. The items I brought aren't different from the generic list other than a bunch of extra food and alcohol to supplement the lack of labor before receiving more migrants. Much of what I've shown you thus far presumes you are embarking somewhere with trees and vegetation, which I'm sure is the norm for the vast majority of embarks in this game. What do you do if there aren't any trees or plants, though? You could crack into the dangerous cavern layers right away and ignore the problems of the lack of surface vegetation, in which case I'd probably recommend an armed embark. Otherwise, I'd recommend simply putting off your wood-related industries and focusing on stone for a while. An embark without trees is a good opportunity to bring along multiple stone crafters to work up an enormous amount of export before the autumn caravan. It also might be a good idea to bring a grower so that you can at least produce some plant materials in subterranean soils. I've given this one butcher and tanner skills as well to salvage the wagon animals since grazing opportunities are difficult to access and they are likely to starve. For items, you might notice that I'm bringing an axe even though I don't have a woodcutter. This is just in case I want to access wood in the caverns early on, though this would be a good option for sacrifice if I wanted more embark points. I've also let go of my precious goblet so that I had enough points to get a decent amount of logs, which means I should probably get my stone crafters to cop up a few mugs right away. The logs are there so I can get a few beds and bins early on, as it might be a minute before I properly access the caverns. I've also got some seeds for my farmer to get busy with. Last, I'm going to slap together something for fun, which is an embark centered around immediately amassing large amounts of bejeweled crowns. Though a bit eccentric, this strategy is predictably very lucrative and has the added benefit of all of your doors being decked out in awesome crowns. 
sometimes even multiple crowns. Though three crowns doesn't even seem to be enough for this guy as he's crying. You'll have the most princely fortress in the land before you even have beds or chairs. For this I've nabbed a woodcutter to cut down trees for fuel and given him masonry and building designer skills so he can quickly prop up wood furnaces and smelters for my crown making industry. I've got a wood burner for producing charcoal and a furnace operator for processing silver and gold ores. The metal crafter is the crown man himself, and lastly I've got a dwarf with gem cutting and setting skills who's going to make the crownsmen by the metal crafter even cooler than they already are. Half-assing this strategy gave me 56,000 trade value in crowns by the time the autumn caravan came around. To put that into perspective, that's 7,000 more value than everything the caravan brought to my fortress. I'm not really recommending this strategy, I'm just using it as an example of how versatile embarking can be. Even without going for a cookie cutter, minor, minor, mason, carpenter, mechanic, crafter, farmer setup, you can still have a highly successful fortress and oftentimes have a lot more flavor. I hope this video has given you some ideas or maybe helped you out if you're relatively new to the game. What I've covered here is only the tip of the iceberg in terms of strategic possibilities, which grow even more vast when you consider that by moving around a few lines in the raw files, you can embark as other races or do interesting things like give dwarves access to tame exotic animals. Abrupt ending.